This is Calf Television. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Alex Bashevansky joined in the studio by Calf President Phil Iannetti, as is our tradition for the last show of the year. Welcome, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Always a um, pleasure. Always a pleasure. And uh, this will fly by the last segment, as it always does when Phil and I get together. But just an annual recap show of all the stuff we've uh, been doing with uh, that happened with Calf this year. And uh, yeah, quite the year, man. Yeah. We started this at the end of May, and I can't believe it's done already. But just the first general thoughts about the way it went this year. You know what? I can't believe the five years have gone by so fast, yeah, Alex. You know, you, you put together a vision, and all of a sudden, together with the group, everyone sees it, and and, and it just keeps growing. And, and that's the beautiful thing about our organization. Our, it's an internal development program, and people now understand it. And that's that's been such a key element for us to see of where we have achieved some great success. And we'll go through it today of all the things that have happened. But uh, really happy about this past year. And, uh, the successes and uh, a lot of our teams. Yeah, um, and we need to point out, uh, of course, we went from three super groups last year to four this year, under 13, under 16, under 20, and the open group. And what that means is we got to get this out of the way off the top is a lot more work, a lot more locations, and we really have to give props to Scott Mosey and Ram Mustafa and all the interns and volunteers who helped make it happen this year. They are absolutely essential, aren't they? You know what, and I don't think uh, people get enough credit sometimes, the ones behind the scenes, and, and if it's not to those people, um, nothing is ever done, right? So uh, those guys have been fantastic, the, the Scott Moseys, the Ram Mustafas, uh, all the people who take the time to make sure that this is successful, right? Especially with the super group, it's a lot of work. People it's don't realize it, so, and now again, going to talk about the vision, the vision was, hey, can we build a super group? And we started with, you know, one, one group in the first year from yeah. 14s and and now we have four of them and to have a stadium have games televised to have yourself and, and this great you know uh, a partnership with you know uh, ECG and BN uh, people watching the game seeing the highlights yep. it's just evolved and we're excited but it, it, it takes a lot of people to make things happen and yep. we're very proud to have those people a part of our team yeah they did an absolutely fantastic job and um we're going to point out some of the well, success stories definitely this year but uh two provincial champs from CAF this year uh, one of them we're going to talk about, first of all, is the under-13s, the CAQ bunch, the boys in blue, as we like to call them. Unbelievable year for these guys. They were the Ontario Cup champions. A CAQ, uh, Carlos, what a program he runs. Just talk about that in the year they had. Yeah, you know what? Carlos is a great person, a great uh, uh, ambassador of the game. You know, he's focused on development, and that we need more people like him. Uh, he's taking these kids at a young age, show them the pathway now has success yeah. you know uh, internally we have a great you know competition which prepare the boys for the Ontario Cup which they went out and they won it and it was there at the finals what a game the boys play with confidence mm -hmm. uh, they beat Woodbridge in the finals a and, and it's important that these people you know are, are, are seen and I'm so happy for all those players that are now being showcased right across our province and potentially our country to see that hey I can get to the provincial team I get to the to national team I can be maybe a CFC player or a CPL player that's coming soon so that that's what uh, what this brings. So we're really, really excited about uh, their success. And in the under-13 group, we should mention as well, as much as CAQ were the Ontario Cup champions, um, between them and one touch out of Hamilton all year, it was like 1A and 1B, and they all would alternate spaces and stuff, and they went one and one with a tie against each other this year, just to show how even those teams were. So OTS, also a fantastic program. Yeah, you know what, in their battles, you watch the games, it's, they're always tight games, and what's ironic is that Woodbridge actually beat OTS in the Ontario Cup to knock them out at the beginning, and uh, you know, last game, at the end of the day, they, they pulled it off. CAQ so, with revenge. CAQ <laughs> to, you know, pulls it off for yeah. the organization, but internally, the games are always tight, and, and, and they build that camaraderie between each other, and that's important, right? That relationships on and off the field. It was a great season, great competition. Yeah, and uh, another champ from CAF was uh, actually Bree from the elite division in CAF, the under 15s. Uh, DJ's group pulls it off, and they were the under 15. Uh, Ontario Cup champions as well, tier two, but uh, Ontario Cup champions, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what, and DJ, uh, you see this guy with a lot of passion. I, I give him uh, so much credit when, in the past three years, he's been part of our program. He's a very loyal person to the kids and, and the program and believed in it, and now they found success, and it shows on, on, on the field. So, um, you know, 
you know, compliments go out to them and their staff and Lori Dana for all the work that they did to make sure that they gave the boys that opportunity to be uh, showcased. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's good. It's good to see that people, again, are being uh, seen in, in, in the province and in the nation. And you know what? TFC. TFCs, I think, saw some of the players and, and are recognizing that. And that's what's critical. How do we showcase these players so someone like TFC or Montreal or Vancouver get to see a player that might not have been identified? Uh, this is great. That's what it's all about. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to talk about arena soccer. We're going to talk about the soon-to-debut uh, uh, MASL franchise in Toronto. Uh, the CPL, as Phil already mentioned, uh, which is going to be our first national league. We've needed this for a long time in Canada. All this stuff coming up. Uh, more CAF TV returning in just a moment. Welcome back to CAF TV. Alex Bastiavansky joined by CAF President Phil Iannati as we do our annual uh, CAF wrap-up show. It's our last one of the year. And uh, just continuing to talk a bit about the supergroups and some success stories. Uh, the under-16 supergroup was, I think this was the most competitive of all the groups from top to bottom this year. Uh, there was no bad games in this group. Uh, you had your McCubby. Of course, a fantastic story going to the Maccabi Games in Israel this year. Best performance ever by a Canadian soccer team at the Maccabi Games due to these boys. Um, Fogo, Lions, Milton, Niagara. Um, there, were, there were no bad games in this division this year. All these teams were so tight, weren't they? And, you know, and that's what the Supergroup was, was built for. How do we get the competition in there that week in, week out, these guys are pushing themselves? And you know what? Um, Again, Maccabi uh, spent time overseas. They came back and they, and they just focused on uh, competing in, in, in the, the program as well. So uh, we're very fortunate to have these teams and these leaders of the games. You got the, the Miltons, the uh, Fogos that you know have some quality players that we've actually recognized that actually come actually away with us when we've gone to Europe. And that's what it's you know it's it's important to see that they have somewhere to play week in week out with good competition. And yeah. we're really happy about the competition level. Uh, the under 20 super group was uh, interesting because for a while it looked like uh, TYFC Toronto Youth was going to run away with things here. Um, and uh, Mississauga United came on strong. And then Toronto Fusion, a team you know very well, yeah, yeah. who's produced some fantastic players. Toronto Fusion comes on strong throughout the year. So those three teams up towards the top, it was a great competition between those three, wasn't it? And you see that in any kind of league play, right? You're going to have your top three, four teams. It happens in the Premiership, happens in Serie A, happens in Spain. You always know those three, four, five teams that are there. Uh, there's no difference here, right? Those three teams, you know, they, there was a battle every time those guys got into the field. And uh, when you thought that oh, this team was just going to walk away with it, you know, uh, Toronto Fusion came up with a couple of few big games and some really good players, players that played overseas that are here now that are probably going to scholarship. Yep. Uh, you know, and uh, even Ottawa. Ottawa always give a battle too. You know, yeah, absolutely, so yeah, they, yeah. They, there was no easy game. So you're Zubia, showing up, yeah, and, uh, showing up every week to have some good competition. Yep. So again, we're very pleased at the competition level of where we're going with this. Uh, the open group uh, was a new team, Clarkson. Uh, Clarkson, uh, Clarkson Pump, fantastic wings, by the way. Just thought I'd throw that in there, but. Uh, <laughs> Clarkson had a rough go at first, and uh, I had you on the show back in July, and you'd mentioned because what happened was rough go, a couple blowouts at first. They weren't quite uh, expecting the level of competition that they got, so they really had to adapt their game, didn't they? And once they did that, they were a great addition to the super group. But it took them a little while to get going, didn't it? Listen, some people when they, they join you at the beginning, they think it, you know, it might not be to what the level they think it is, and all of a sudden it's a wake-up call. It's like, wow, there's some really good players here, and the speed of play is, you know, at a high level. So, uh, you know, the likes of Toronto Croatia and, and, and Atomic, uh, uh, you know, really, really good teams. You, you're not going to walk into them and think that uh, that game is going to be a relaxing game it's it's passion at its best with those teams there and representation of what their culture is too and that's beautiful so now all of a sudden Clarkson came out there and and, and picked up their game uh, Josh Patello came to me and he said Phil you know what this thing is really good and the competition level is fantastic we're looking forward to it I think next year will be even way better we're going to talk about a couple players a few players more than a couple that have actually moved over as is a calf tradition moving over to academies in Europe um, just got uh, Milton's Joey D'Agostino um, also Milton's uh, Giordano Mancini uh, going to uh, Spain and Greece respectively to clubs over there. Um, Andy Lamontang from Brampton City United. This is a huge one. He was actually scouted by PSG Paris Saint-Germain and ended up going over and playing with PSG Academy, uh, a tournament in Spain 
uh, in, I believe it was early September, and played in every game for those guys. Stories like that are what CAF's all about, isn't it? But just great to see those guys moving over and doing well. Yeah, and again, success stories. I and mean, that's what you want to see, you know? You want to be able to showcase our talent. And when these boys actually have that opportunity, whether it's through a relationship, um, you know, because a lot of times it's, it's word, it's relationship from one person to another that gives them that, that opportunity. Now, now they're, in, they're in that professional environment, and they understand what it takes, Alex, to become a pro. And if we can help them by uh, watching highlights, you know, I saw my time you know, score some goals mm -hmm. and give Brampton City uh, that push. And it's that's critical because all of a sudden now he starts watching and believing in himself and that's what that super group does that's what the show does it helps even maybe scouts outside see a player and identify a player that's what happened even to Flores so yeah. when you see people having that that opportunity to play and, and show themselves week in week out of uh, their skills uh, and then go and present themselves in Europe Hey, we're building that bridge. We're building those pathways. We've got to continue to build that and, and showcase the talent that we have here in Canada. Another guy, one of the top young players in this country on the uh, Fusion team, only 17 years old, uh, Michael Thornton, who previously was over in Europe, played with a few academies, including uh, Real Madrid Academy. Um, had to come back to Canada, but at 18, he will be going over back to Europe. Um, and not just was he a stand-up with Fusion this year, but something near and dear to Phil's heart, of course, as the GM of the Canadian National Arena team was. He was one of the youngest players. He actually made the Canadian Arena team against Mexico. You chose him. Why? You know, not only a great player, but what a fantastic person. Absolutely. You know, and that's what it takes to make a complete player. And this kid has it. His commitment, his discipline, his passion is there. He has uh, the strength, the power, the understanding uh, of the game. Yep. I think he's going to bring so much to Canadian soccer. Uh, and when he came onto the arena game, he, he did well, um, has lots of opportunities to, yeah. to grow the game. We're going to talk about Michael in the next segment. We've got to take a quick break. More Cat TV coming up in just a second. Welcome back to CAF Television, our annual end of season wrap up show. Uh, Alex Bastiavansky with CAF president Phil Iannati. Uh, just continuing in the vein of talking about uh, arena soccer uh, and Michael Thornton, Phil was mentioning just before we went to break, uh, one of CAF's young superstars and uh, one of the youngest guys to make the Canadian national arena team. What, Phil is a GM of the national team, so I was just asking why you chose him for the team and what you saw. Yeah, you know what, and, and when Michael came out for the trial, um, you know, he, he was at the beginning trying to understand the game, right? Here's a player playing probably 11 11 you know, uh, the border game is a completely different game, fast pace, you got to really get used to it, you know, um, and every session, every week, he got better and better, and that's progression, you know, so it's exciting to see a 17-year-old player uh, who was selected by the, by the coaching staff, by Hector Marinado and Giuliano Oliveira, Oliveira and yeah. Paul Ciccarelli, and they see something in this player, you know, so, uh, you know, very happy to see him, and even Sebastian Zabalos, you know, another player that's come through the system. Like these are the kind of guys we have to promote and make sure that they're seen right across our country. There's they're football players, they're soccer players. We have to give them that opportunity, whether it's the arena game, the 11v11 game, the futsal game. Yeah. We got to promote the game of soccer, and, and these are young talents uh, that potentially might not be ready for uh, one side of the game, but. Right. They're in a game they did very well, and we want to continue to build them. Well, it was a very exciting year for arena soccer. Uh, everything got going this year. I'd say it was a dream for a while of Serge Giancola um, and, you know, and yourself as well. But this year it all really cranked up at the first press, press conference at the launch of CASA uh, back at the end of June, beginning of July, and uh, all leading up to the first ever arena friendly, uh, which took place against Mexico back on October 1st. Um, what a year for arena soccer. Before we get into the friendly, uh, just just talk about that and all the work that went into getting this thing launched. Yeah, we, we talked it many times in the show and it was just a dream back then, right? You know, and, and the game's been around. It's been around, in, you know, with Montreal Impact and Toronto Thunderhawks back in the day, Edmonton Driller. So the game has been here, but on a national level, a federation level was never there. And uh, they're part of the Pan American Feder Mini Federation and the, the World Mini Federation. So there's a whole pathway for this game. It's exciting. So to have the ability to bring everyone together for the national team and 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 have a, a stadium at Hershey which was just it was bouncing it was bouncing from the beginning to the end and all of a sudden you hear go Canada go I think the players felt the energy so a historic day for a lot of people for a lot of players for the coaching staff uh, why because there's a Toronto franchise coming back which there's a press conference on the 24th with a lot of information coming to that point mm -hmm. where hey Toronto franchise MESL next year follow up with uh, the national program and everything else that's going to occur in the next couple of years so Phil just took 
my next five questions and ran with them essentially and covered a bit of them. But let's go into more detail. Of course, the friendly Phil is referring to uh, was October 1st against Mexico at the Hershey Center. And it was it was an event uh, over 3,500 strong uh, there. It was just um, it was an atmosphere. Uh, I go to a lot of OHL games. I haven't seen an atmosphere like that with all due respect in a long time, even at an OHL game in Mississauga. It was fantastic. It was packed. And uh, I think you may have converted a lot of young fans who didn't know about the arena game, and they sure do now. What's ironic is a lot of the people that I saw in the stadium, the people that I know that played the game back in the day at Soccer World or Soccer City, they know the game. We didn't have the, the big bubbles or the soccer centers. It was, it was the arena game that we played. And all of a sudden, they came with their children, and their children never seen this game before. We're just excited. Blown away by they, it, yeah. And everyone's like, I, I'm, I'm in. I'm buying season tickets. I can't wait till the Toronto franchise comes because we love it. It was entertainment at its best. Yeah. And I have no doubt on my mind as we grow this right across our country, this will be a big part of uh, soccer uh, moving forward. And you know, looking forward to because we did put an application in to host the World Cup for 2020. And you know what? If uh, we're approved, I think it's going to be something special here. Um, you mentioned the players like Michael Thornton, who it was an eye-opener. They had to learn the game. Well, I mean, I talked with David Guzman right after the game on the pitch. David Guzman formerly played for TFC um, as well. He's been a very high-level player. He's a fantastic uh, footballer. And David said right out, he said, Alex, he said, um, I'm going to be completely honest, this is an entirely different game. Is. This is not a game that was actually familiar to David as much as he's, he's a great 11v11 player. He wasn't as used to the arena game. Now, of course, his skill transferred over. That's why you chose him. He's still good a right. player to leave off. Mm -hmm. But he had to. And as the game went on, you could see uh, first half was mostly Mexico. Second half, our boys were learning on the, sort of on the fly and they narrowed the gap and we mostly controlled the second half and two beautiful goals too. You know what, we had the training sessions and each training session got better and better and when the coach came in, Julian Oliveira, obviously the coach of Milwaukee Wave, started doing some little tactical things and these guys started getting it, right? Because they've never played. You know, the Adrian Kantz, national professional player, the, the Guzman's, uh, Guzman, sorry, uh, very, very uh, technical players and great outdoor 11-11. The transition was a little bit challenging and we said it, we lack experience. We're the, you know, we understand where we're at, but you know what, we had the Ian Bennett's, the Josh Lemos, the Daniel Shamalis, the, the Vahid uh, uh, Asapur. We had those guys that played in the MSL, which helps us a lot, but still, it's going to take some time. They were instrumental in teaching the guys And you saw the fourth yeah. quarter starting to teach everyone. We're excited. Why? Because the Toronto franchise, when it comes next year, and these guys are playing consistently, yeah. Canada's going to be a wrecking uh, country for the arena game. It's it's in our blood, whether it's yeah. the hockey or the boards, it's, it's the, the glass, arena game. It's yeah. part of our blood, so it's time to transition onto that. MASL franchise launching in the fall of 2018. We'll talk about more about that later. And the CPL, we've actually got to uh, get to in the next segment. More Cat TV coming up in just a second. Welcome back to CAF Television, uh, our last segment of the year on our very last show. Alex Bastiabanski with CAF President Phil Iannotti. Uh, we mentioned we wanted to touch on the Canadian Premier League, which will be launching hopefully as soon as uh, 2018. Um, but I uh, wanted to ask you about that, and, and because, of course, CAF is so big on having a professional path and a pyramid of play, um, CAF affiliation with TFC and stuff, and now there's going to be another avenue as well, the CPL. How do you see this all tying in together? You know what, uh, Alex, yeah, we're really excited at the CPL coming in. I uh, spoke to some of the people that are involved in it. They they expect, whether it's 2018 or 2019, that we're going to have a national league. And by doing so, that's going to give more opportunities for our Canadian players. And that's critical. Uh, why? Because uh, if we ever want to compete at the national level, we just saw the U.S. not make the World Cup shocking to them, right? We here in Canada have been uh, accepting for the past, what, 30, 20, 30 years. years, so yeah, 86 was the last yeah. time we were in. We've accepted just bureaucracy. We're just, okay, we didn't get in, no more. We need to change that. And that starts with the leadership of the groups that have now pushed for the CPL, why? Because we need Canadian players playing at a high level, week in, week out, that have that opportunity to be scouted by the national team coach in a, in a domestic program league. So uh, kudos goes out to TFC Montreal and Vancouver. It's a North American league, it's uh, MLS. It's It's been great, but at the same time now, having something that's, that's that are our own is fantastic. And given another pathway for our players yep. to be part of, it's great, you know, that's what we're looking forward to. Well, by the time we relaunch the show next year and the CAF season relaunches, we'll be able to talk a lot more about the CPL and the developments about what have been happening. Uh, touch on a couple of uh, events that happened this year that were big events in CAF before we go. 
uh, the inaugural BioSteel Canada Cup. Speaking of uh, top-notch Canadian players, of course, uh, that Phil did in conjunction with BioSteel and Dwayne De Rosario. Uh, just a great event at Downs View Park, wasn't it? Who better to be an ambassador of this country than Dwayne De Rosario? You know, for me, one of the best players, if not the best player to ever play in this country, uh, uh, accolades with the MLS and national program. And when he came to to me with the say, listen, with me say, let's build something special in, in a tournament here in Toronto. It's the six, it's Toronto. So I said, let's do it. So we we launched it. It was successful. We're looking already forward to next year and and working with professional clubs, uh, especially with the MLS and uh, Canadian teams to have those players come play and those teams participate in in 2018. Um, tryouts are being held for the CAF selects um, that uh, will be traveling abroad um, in the new year. Yeah, we, just, we, got, we got invited to Italy again. The boys did fantastic last year. So uh, it's all professional clubs. It's the Inters, right. Juventus, the Romas, the Lazios, the Paris Saint-Germain. They're all going to be in attendance at the Hater uh, tournaments in, in Rome. So uh, tryouts just start uh, next weekend. So we're really excited. I've seen the talent. Dwayne De Rosario again accepted to be the coach of that awesome. team. So we're, we're looking to leave uh, at the end of the year, December 31st, uh, for nine days in Rome playing against these professional teams and uh, in a tournament that is uh, very spectacular. And, and that comes on the heels of last year, uh, two big events. Uh, CAF did go to Italy, um, and CAF also went to Dubai, which was, uh, I mean, both were really eye-opening experiences for the kids, weren't they? I mean, we had a couple players on the show who talked about that and how amazing that was. You know, especially with Dubai, you had Michel Sagado, the Real Madrid player, one of the top players for Spain, playing right fullback. He's the guy in charge of that event. So, um, you know, when you get there, the professionalism of, uh, of Dubai was second to none. And um, what a beautiful place. So the boys did well in competing. Again, being invited, hopefully, for March, April to compete in there. And, and some other tournaments that we want to get the boys going out to showcase the talent, to show all, all talent that we have here in, in, in Ontario. Well, we're... Just about out of time, but uh, last question here for Phil, which is, um, it's, it's five years old, but this is actually the sixth season for CAF. It um, started in 2012, and it was, uh, you know, just for you and the evolution of the Canadian Academy of Football over the last few years, um, from where it's come from and where it's going, um, is this the path that you envision for CAF, and what do you see as the next step? You know what, it, it, anything you do, and um, it starts with the vision and passion. And you know what, we saw something, you know, five years ago of building a, a platform for players to be identified and uh, it's evolved even beyond our, our, our thoughts. Why? Because, you know, it, it's been challenges though, Alex, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, bringing a system that was outside into the system was not easy. A lot of hard work and commitment uh, from a lot of people, uh, which gave every kid an opportunity to be showcased. And that's what's critical. Yeah. How do we give every kid in this province, in this country, the ability to be seen provincially, nationally, or even not, you know, professionally, mm -hmm. right? And I think we've come up with a great system, a program, an internal program. That, so I'm really excited what CAF has become uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a program where it's, it's all about unification, yeah. bringing people together for the betterment of the game. And I can't wait till the next year and five years from now as we hopefully find that professional player that comes back and says, Hey, that time I spent at CAF when I was 12, 13 years old, helped me. You know, that's what it's all about. Then we did our job. It's been getting better and better every year. And I uh, can't wait to see 2018 and what it's going to bring our way. Thanks, buddy. Always a pleasure. Great season. Thank you. Um, thank you to you for tuning in every week to all the players and everyone involved with CAF. And thanks to everyone in our fantastic studios here at uh, I Think Channels. Um, great job all year long. Just remember in the offseason at CAFSoccer.com. Uh, just to keep up to date on everything that's been going on and will be happening in the Canadian Academy of Football. Thank you so much for watching, folks. We'll see you next season for more. Back to you.